Well, nowadays, there's an increasing trend toward ecotourism holidays. So what is ecotourism? Well, it's a form of tourism which should not only protect, but also actively improve our environment and its cultures. However, many forms of tourism which are presented as sustainable, nature-based, and environmentally friendly are often not what they seem, and this is rapidly becoming a somewhat thorny issue. Governments, as well as the tourism industry, promote ecotourism, but there are very well-founded concerns that in many instances it not only lacks adequate scientific foundations, but is also not viable as a solution to the world's social and environmental problems, which, of course, is what ecotourism is supposed to be about. Many ecotourism holidays are really nothing more than a marketing ploy, and indeed, in the worst cases, can be said to even threaten local cultures, economies, and natural resource bases. The issue is further confused by the multitude of terms to describe types of travel which supposedly protect the environment. Other than ecotourism, we have adventure travel, sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, nature-based travel, green travel, and cultural tourism, to name just a few. So the problem we have here is whether a potential traveler who wants a legitimately environmentally friendly travel experience can make the right choice when confronted with this type of marketing.
The autumn term is in full swing now, and deadlines are fast approaching. So, to help you with the final touches on your assignments, I wanted to say a few words about proofreading. Most people find it easy to spot problems with grammar or punctuation when reading someone else's writing, but it's always much harder to see these things when looking at your own. Since you won't always have the luxury of having someone else proofread for you, let's look at a few ways to effectively do it yourself. When proofreading your own work, it's important that you know what kind of errors you're looking for. Think about the kinds of things you've had trouble with in the past, and try to eliminate them for a start. Now, most people know to look for things like grammar, spelling, and punctuation, but don't forget that the big picture is just as important. Make sure your work is organised in a logical way, and that each paragraph represents a clear, distinct idea. You might take yourself to a quiet spot and try reading your work aloud. As you do, make sure it flows. Don't forget to check your referencing and citations. If possible, try to give yourself at least a day or two to complete the proofreading process. It's easier to spot mistakes if you've had a bit of a break from looking at the paper.
The heyday of the English landscape garden was the 18th century, and it stood for many things. The appreciation of natural beauty, of course, but also the idea of a civilized life, good taste, one's personal philosophy, and one's social status. Gardens also, though it is hard for us to credit, became expressions of their owners' political affiliations. Until the picturesque style emerged as part and parcel of the Romantic movement, gardens had been strictly formal, laid out with mathematical precision, following the Italian and French examples. There then came a backlash against this rigid formality, led by, among others, the poet Alexander Pope. Pope and his allies argued for a more natural nature. Lord Burlington was a major figure in the landscape garden movement, and he was famously influenced by his love of the Italian architect Andrea Palladio, along with the picturesque or romanticized landscapes of Italian classical painting. With these in mind, he scattered his gardens and parks with classical Greek and Roman temples and statues. In other words, he wanted to make the garden look like those paintings. Political parties in most democracies not only have to win more votes than their rivals to get into power, they also have to persuade the electorate that it is worth their going out to vote in the first place. In the UK, turnout is frequently low, and one reason cited is the weather. Some countries, therefore, have made voting compulsory. It is against the law not to vote, and failing to vote is a punishable offence. In Austria, for example, failure to vote results in an automatic fine, as it does in Australia. As a consequence, voter turnout is rarely less than 92% in both these countries. Other countries have penalties that affect the individual in more practical ways. In Greece, for example, although it is no longer acted on, passports were confiscated or not granted. And in Bolivia, Non-voters may be banned from using banks or schools for up to three months. The punishment in countries such as France, Germany, the UK and so on is seeing the government you didn't elect raise your taxes. The nature-nurture debate is still going on. It is not a question of taking sides because we know that both play an important part in what makes us who we are. It is more a question of emphasis. Which of them has the greatest influence? On the nature side, we have what we get from our genes, our inherited traits, eye color and other physical traits, for example, but also, some believe, non-physical ones such as temperament. For example, you might be quick to anger or have a nervous temperament, and this even extends to sense of humor. On the nurture side, there is what we get from our environment and our upbringing, what we learn. Research into the human genome has recently made it clear that both sides are partly right. Nature gives us inborn abilities and traits, while nurture takes these genetic tendencies and shapes them as we grow and learn and mature. This is an important point, as it means, contrary to the belief of some, that we are not wholly determined by our genes. Scientists have known for years that eye and hair color are determined by specific genes. But some now claim that such traits as intelligence and personality are also encoded in our genes. What troubles me when I'm asked the question, can creative writing be taught, usually asked in a skeptical tone of voice, is not that I can't find an answer, but trying to figure out why I'm being asked. What do they want me to say? No, of course it can't. I just like taking people for a ride. I'm a con artist. 
Obviously, you can't teach someone to have a talent for storytelling or a love of language or how to write extremely well. But there are important lessons to be gotten across that will improve their writing and, at the very least, make it publishable. For me, the best starting point is the habit of close reading, really close, and responding to the language. Forget about grand themes and ethical content, whatever, for the moment, and ask if the author writes badly or well. So, writing can be taught through reading, through literature. Then I'd say, when it comes to your own writing, that you need to learn how to edit, to know when to say, you don't need that word or that sentence, and that whole paragraph can go. It's one of the most important lessons a writing class can teach. As for producing a Tolstoy or a Dickens, well, people like that tend to get there by their own route. Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means, the sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury, begins at around 90. Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing. Loud noises, especially when they come at you every day, all this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. The first thing to go is your high-frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds in words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said. When parents are asked how they handle their very unruly children, most will admit that they are likely to use physical forms of punishment. This is not to say that a parent generally hits their child each and every time they are bad. Nevertheless, parents generally use physical punishment as a last resort after having unsuccessfully tried other forms of discipline with children who have become very bad. Those who believe in physical punishment, however, are unaware of the fact that it does not lead to better children. In fact, the opposite is true. Research findings show that children from homes where corporal punishment is the norm exhibit more antisocial behaviour than children whose parents seldom or never hit them. For example, children whose parents systematically use corporal punishment are more often than not behind any classroom disruptions. Such children not only create discipline problems at school, but they are also overly aggressive. In addition, they have extremely low self-esteem and a negative attitude to those around them. On the other hand, children whose parents use less harsh methods of discipline have a healthier attitude towards their school environment and... Learning a language in the classroom is never easy and quite frankly it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start. They were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course language is one of those added but significant extras.
The spinal cord, the link between the brain and the body, is a band of nervous tissue about the thickness of your little finger that runs through the backbone. Nerve cells called motor neurons convey electric impulses that travel from the brain to the spinal cord, branching off at the appropriate point and passing to the various parts of the body. Similarly, sensory neurons transmit messages from organs and tissues via the spinal cord to the brain. But the spinal cord also functions without the brain having to intervene. It alone controls those actions called spinal reflexes that need to be carried out very fast in response to danger. It follows from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are different manifestations of the same thing. Now researchers have stopped light cold and then brought it back to life or light in an entirely different place. The Harvard researchers sent a light pulse into a sodium cloud cooled to about 460 degrees below zero. That's the theoretical point where matter stops all movement. The light pulse was compressed by a factor of about 50 million at the extreme temperature, and it actually changed state, sort of like frozen water. But it also split into two forms of matter. One stayed frozen in the sodium, while the other crawled along at just 200 meters per hour. That second form, called a matter wave, contains the exact information of the original light wave. And when researchers sent it into a second sodium cloud a fraction of a millimeter away, the wave was converted back into light. And since fiber optic communications use light, that means that someday we may be able to stop them, store them, and turn them back on, just like a light switch. The artists and conservative politicians earn their rules of politics. You will acquire new skills during your academic studies. The same approach reached the same explanation of the problem. The reading list will be available before the course begins.